Hey everyone, today I'm joined by Albert Anastasia's son. Albert was a very major mafia figure back in the day. He was one of the early godfathers of the mafia. Albert's son that I'm interviewing today's name is Jack O'Halloran. Jack and I talk about his father Albert and his life of crime. His father Albert was murdered when Jack was very young. Jack explains why his father was murdered during our interview today. After his father was killed, his father's friends started to come into his life, such as Meyer Lansky, Carlos Marcello, Lucky Luciano, and Raymond Patriarca Sr. Jack would go on to have a career in the movie industry, and he became a professional fighter. Jack has been around all over the world. He's got a really interesting story. Please subscribe to my channel if you want to get more interviews like this, and without further ado, let's get into Jack's story. How you doing, Jack? Thank you for coming on my show. It's my pleasure. Well, I appreciate you taking out some time and coming on, because you got one hell of a story. Um, your father was Albert Anastasia, so I think we should start with your very early life and what it was like for you growing up and who your father was. Howard, uh, I only met him once. Uh, he put a minder around me when I was younger, a guy by the name of Rip Collins, whose brother was Tommy Collins, a famous general from the Irish Revolution. And Rip was a, an engineer at General Electric, and he, he uh, ran the Irish people down at the waterfront. And my father controlled all the waterfronts. So they were, they were pretty good friends. So <clears throat> Rip was like a minder of mine for my younger period of my life, and uh, kept telling me that I was a special kid, and that I that he would teach me this. Too. He taught me a lot of things and how to live and stuff like that in life. And uh, so your your father, he had gotten murdered when you were pretty young. So I was 14 years old. Okay. So you were 14. So in, in between time, I mean, you didn't really meet him. I mean, what was the situation? No, I only met him once. He, he came to watch me play a football game. And, uh, what was yeah. the situation with that? Albert was, uh, well, I mean, I knew who he was. It was in the papers all the time. But <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, I was kind of shocked to find out a reality of, where I fit into his life. And I was in World War II, 1942, Albert was put into an army base in Pennsylvania. Um, and he was a sergeant. This is a funny story. He was a sergeant teaching soldiers how to be longshoremen. And they were looking for him everywhere. You know? uh, he was in the army. So he was, it was, a, and he, but he never spent a night on the base. He was in Philadelphia every night. He, and that's where he met my mother. And, and I was a, a wartime love affair. 1943, I was conceived. Um, but he, um, the, the captain of his platoon was reading in the newspapers about Albert Anastasia, how they were looking for him. And, and you know, uh, Louis Lepke had just been executed and they were, looking for Albert everywhere because of Murder, Inc. And um, the captain called the New York Police Department. He said, uh, this guy, Anastasia, you people are all looking for. I have him right here in my army. <laughs> and, and this is how much power they had. The guy said, what are you talking about? He said, this uh, Albert Anastasia guy, you guys are looking for him everywhere. Well, he's right here in my army. And the guy said, hold on a minute. And he came back on the line. He said, ah, he said, that's all media. He said, we're not looking for Albert anywhere. I said, that's all just newspaper stuff. <laughs> <laughs> that's insane. I mean, I mean, so he was a part of the army as well as the mafia. Well, I mean, when he came out of the army, they made him a citizen. because, And they never deported him. You know, he when he got into trouble back in 19, 19, 19, 1920, when he killed the guy on the waterfront, and they put him in jail, and they, he was on death row. And he helped an old timer in, inside jail. And the guy reached out to Charlie Luciano and said, uh, this guy should be out of jail. He shouldn't be here. He'd be, he'd be a big asset for you out there. So they rearranged another trial for Albert and all the witnesses had disappeared huh. and, uh, and they had to let him go, but they never deported him. Wow. They dropped all the charges and let him go. And they, and they, but they never deported him. And he, he paved the way for Charlie Luciano to become the head of the commission. Yeah. You know, they killed several people and got rid of several people. And he took over the Masseri family, which became the Anastasia family. Mm -hmm. And it was the Anastasia family 
when the commission was put together. And, uh, but Albert wouldn't go in the drug business. And he said that and he was when Brando depicted him in The Godfather. And they went to Brando to get in the drug business. And he said, if we touch it, our children will touch it. It'll be the downfall of the family. Mm-hmm. My father said that. Mm-hmm. And it was the worst mistake they ever made. And the, the night before he was assassinated, they met with him in the same hotel, uh, Santo Traficante and, uh, and Carl Marcello. And uh, they begged him. They said, Albert, it's only business. You know, just it's just business. He said, not a business that we signed up for. Not just take my name off the list. Mm-hmm. And the next day he was he was executed in that barber chair downstairs in the same hotel. But he knew it was coming. He already sold his house to Buddy Hackett in Fort Lee. And his wife was from Canada originally, so they had arranged for them to go back to Canada. Um, he knew what was coming. He uh and they tried to kill Costello because Costello had one of the best political books ever in the history of the mafia. And he told them, he sat down, he said, you know, if we, they will allow us to do a lot of things, but they will not tolerate the drug business. They won't allow us to get involved in drugs. And, uh, and that's because the government was involved in drugs. So, you know, they, it was a kind of a touch and go situation all the way around. But, Albert was the glue that held, held everything together. When they assassinated him, things fell apart. People started shooting. People got greedy over it. They forgot how to make money. They got into the drug business and uh, prostitution. And, you know, it was it's sad the way the families fell apart because they started shooting each other. So greed. what do you think ultimately why, why he was killed then, your father? He was killed because he wouldn't go in the drug business. He wouldn't. He wouldn't. Tell, he wouldn't let him bring it through the harbor. He said, "You're not bringing that stuff in through my watch." And Genovese wanted to do it badly because he was. He had been doing it. And Genovese got deported to Italy back in the '30s. He opened up a heroin plant down in Sicily, and they were bringing heroin in from south, from down in, in Africa and South America and stuff, and they were shipping it up. From Sicily into New York. And he, um, my Corgi, you want to go out? <laughs> I mean, if, if you got to pause for a minute, we can. I can cut no, it no, out. No, no, no. My wife should talk about it. Oh, she's got him? Yeah. Um, okay. So, well, they, just you know, they, they, the, when, when, when they assassinated Albert, then they realized that he was the glue that held everybody together because Murder Inc. was, was a, a a police force inside the mafia. They never killed innocent people. They only policed their own people. And Murder Inc. got in trouble when Abe Rellis became the very first rat. They, Abe Rellis had done something really bad, and Lefke gave him a terrible beating. He should have killed him hmm. because he ran right to the cops, and he put 11 guys on death row for Murder Inc. And, and- that was the downfall of Murder Inc., and so your father was the head master behind Murder Inc. Is that correct? My father was 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 the head of Murder Inc. along with uh, Lefke Buckholder, mm-hmm. who was and, a, a Jewish a garment guy who ran the garment district in New York. And they had killed like how many people? Did they kind of estimate it? At? Wasn't it a few hundred or something? Oh, probably about a thousand or so. A thousand, damn, across the country. But they were but they were policemen. They policed their own people. If you were involved in with them and you did something stupid, you were about to rat. They'd, el- they'd eliminate you themselves. They didn't. Uh, wasn't you know? You didn't have. You didn't have a lot of rats in in back in the day in the beginning. Right. Of, you know, they took care of all that. So how many they had their own police force? How many members were a part of the murdering? Were estimated, I suppose. I guess, you know, if you really got down to it and went across the country about people who were in different states that were involved with them, uh, you'd probably get maybe a few hundred, 300. Damn. Yeah, so I'm sure they, there were uh, all kinds of hits going on around the country. Well, they, but they, they, it was a whole different kind of scenario. They, you know, when, when the original, when the mafia came into the country, and they set up shop. They were, in actuality, it was the, the government, 
and industry and, and organized crime, they were all partners. Huh. They all, you know, they all watched each other's back. This guy did this and this guy did that, but they were, they were pretty much partners. And, you know, the neighborhoods, when I was a kid raised up in Philadelphia, we never locked our front door. Mm-hmm. People slept out in their backyards in the summertime because it was so hot and no one had air conditioning or anything. So they used to, they used to sleep in the backyards outside because it was cool and nobody ever bothered anybody. You know, mm-hmm. neighborhoods were much safer. Kids went out in the morning and played from, I mean, I, when I was a kid, we never came in until dinner time. Out all day. We're outside playing all the time, you know, in, in the streets and, you know, with bicycles and roller skates and, and all kinds of crazy stuff. But, you you know, uh, but at dinner time, you better be sitting at that table at a certain time. You know, there was, there was no families sat down and ate together. It was, it was a whole different whole different structure of raising people and stuff. You you look to your parents eyeball to eyeball. So mm-hmm. if you were doing drugs, they would have known right off the get-go. Oh, None yeah. of that stuff existed then, you understand? So you're saying back then with the mafia and everything having its presence, they really well, protected they were their... Lot safer. You didn't have people with drive-by shootings and stuff like that. You never had any of that jazz. You know, nobody... I mean, you'd have a burglar here or there, but that burglar got caught before he even got out of the neighborhood. <laughs> okay. I mean, they, they, they policed their own neighborhood. They took care. And the old timers lived in the neighborhood where everybody lived at. They, they didn't, uh, it, was, it wasn't until later on that they started building these mansions outside of Long Island and stuff. You know, or, yeah. Other so, before, I mean, Raymond Patriarca lived in the same neighborhood until he died. Damn. He drove a Jeep. He, he 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 walked around like Joe Doe, man. He was a, Raymond was a trip, and up on Federal Hill there was a tailor shop, and behind the tailor shop he had his office, so you'd have to go through the tailor shop to go into his office. You so know, yeah, yeah. So you weren't allowed in there unless you had a reason to be there. Yeah. So, so it, was, it was differently, and, and Raymond controlled New England pretty well. And you had a pretty good relationship <laughs> with him, right? Growing up, Raymond. Oh yeah. God. When I was. <laughs> <laughs> when I was doing, I was doing a film, King Kong, and uh, we were shooting some segments in Hawaii. And we flew over to Hawaii, and I got off the plane. The, the Samoans were the were the teamsters over there. And I got off the plane, and the guy came up to me, and he said, uh, "Raymond sends his respects to you, and anything you need here, just let me know." <laughs> I said, "He reached all the way to Hawaii," and I said, "Oh, okay, thank you very much." Wow. But it was. So- uh, like I say, it was a different. Uh, it was a whole different scenario. When I was, I was, when my father was assassinated. I came under thumb to to uh, Meyer and to Frank, and they taught me how to stay out of jail. You know, a lot of friends of mine that I was I'm very close to in New England, Pennsylvania, New York, that these guys did 30, 40 years in jail. Because they would never open their mouths. They never said they never would rat. And they, they, you know, did the crime due to time, and, and they spent a lot of time away. You know, and I was very lucky that I never I got caught up in that because I moved around all the time. I never sat in one place. And they, they, they taught me how to do that. So with Meyer Lansky, when he came into your life, that was soon after your father had passed. Right after he passed away, yeah. Did he come out to you and reach out with Frank Costello because they knew that you were? Uh, well, I got with- a call from a lawyer and said you you should uh, you, they would like to see you in New York. Mm-hmm. And I went to New York and sat down with him and uh, sat down with with Frank and, and Meyer both. And, and I used to sit with a guy named Tommy Lucchese and um, some of the old timers up there were they were they were just a different breed of people. Frank was Frank Costello. We used to meet at the Sherry Netherlands, up on the roof. There was a, a big uh, roof garden up at the top, and he'd smoke like a chimney. God. <laughs> and I would meet him up there, so no one would ever see you in restaurants or anything. You just—they never wanted me to be seen, or people to take pictures, you know, of me being together with people. And Meyer, I used to meet at train stations and different places, and I would get a phone call from a lawyer in Florida, and they'd say. There's a ticket waiting for you at the Philadelphia airport flying down to Miami. 
and you're staying at the Eden Rock. He owned the Eden Rock and the Fountain Blue both. And you're staying, there's a room there for you. And, and the next morning, I want you to walk south on the beach. <laughs> I used to go out and be walking south, and Meyer would be behind me, kicking sand on my leg while Damn. he was talking to me all the way down the beach. Oh, man. I mean, that's insane that you were able to be around these guys and have them mentor you. Were they trying to groom you to be in the mafia or just? Well, I, Meyer, Meyer was one of the smartest men I ever met. He taught me business. Mm hmm I mean, he was he was a clever, clever guy, boy. And he taught me business, taught me about profits and share and how companies run and different things. And uh, I learned a lot from these people. You know, they, they taught me structure yeah. more than I would have ever learned in any university, you know. So it was, <laughs> uh, it was kind of a great education. And the connections were, were phenomenal. You, you, just, you went across the country. And, and well, when yeah. things got really, really bad where there was a lot of infiltration with with people ratting on everybody this guy's ratting on that guy this guy's ratting on that guy i moved to europe and i lived in europe for 20 years oh really to, uh, out of sight out of mind but yeah. i then i got attached to a lot of people in europe that ran london the people who ran germany and and i would spend time in italy and and i got to know a lot of good people over there and i lived I lived, I lived in Ireland, I lived on the Isle of Man, I lived in London, and I lived in Belgium, and I spent time in Italy. So I just moved around from different place to place. And I, uh, yeah, so I mean, you were with these connections, were they able to help you get in touch with people in all these different uh, countries and stuff like that? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I was London. I knew all the gangsters of London. The Craze were good friends of mine. The Nashes, the Richardsons. Uh, I knew them all. People in Germany the same way. Wilfred Schultz. People who ran the country. And, uh, and there were some good people. And, you, and I learned a lot in it. You know, it's just, uh, we're, uh, another thing I, I wanted to bring up as well. Um, Albert had another son, didn't he? Albert Anastasia yeah. Jr. So yeah. did you ever get to meet your brother? We talked on the phone a couple of times. We never really sat down once, I think, with him in New York. Oh, and he, did he pass sisters. away then? Huh? He's passed away now? He's gone. Then there's two sisters, and one of them still, she's married to Anthony Scotto. Oh. He took over the waterfront. And, uh, and they, they own a few restaurants in New York. So do you, did you I, bring I, You know, I don't, uh, I don't like, Make a habit of association, but we've met and we've talked, and you know everybody knows who everybody is. Right. So I mean, you just kind of kept a kept a distance from all of them. Yeah, I mean, it was they, they they're not involved. They they're, they're business people. You know, they're they're very straightforward. You know, uh, they they're not involved in the families. They 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 went a whole different way. Mm -hmm. I mean, Anthony Anthony Anastasia. It was Anastasio. The real name, the family name is Anastasio. My father changed it to Anastasia because he didn't want the involvement of the family to be boiled over to other members. And Tony, tough Tony Anastasia, took over the waterfront after my father because my father gave him the strength. And he was very smart. He was a college-educated guy. And he was he was uh, one of the – on the waterfront was modeled after Tony, tough Tony Anastasia. He ran the waterfront. Oh, so then that that's where they made a lot of their money with your father and his crime family, and they just kind of kept passing it down and down. Yeah, I mean, they were it was a different. They had a whole different scenario of how they did things, and they, you know, my father owned a lot of companies and different companies in, in Pennsylvania and stuff, and uh, they were they were business people. You know, they they they. Were, they ran they ran their lives in a very methodical manner. And then it got out of hand. After Albert got killed and stuff, and people just thought they could get away with everything they could get away with. And you know and then when the ratting started, boy, it was where guys were afraid to go to jail, so they would ratting on this guy and that guy. And that you never had that there was honor amongst them before. I mean, true honor. Yeah. Was, to be a made individual was an honor. And with it was something you took an oath of a marathon and you just never you never opened your mouth. If you got caught doing something, you got caught doing the crime, you did the time. Right. And 
with you bringing that up as well with people getting away with stuff and was when after your father he was killed who was assumed because it was never confirmed that were the shooters in that i mean there's all kinds of different people they say were no one ever got convicted of it and they and they they they, but it was dealt with right It, it was dealt with and they there were so many false stories of who did what and you know (laughs) <laughs> who actually shot him and, and, and stuff like that. And, you know, and it was all, and it was dealt with. At the end of the day, the, mm-hmm. the people who paid the price for what, what happened. It was dealt with, you know. Okay. It, was, uh, it was, uh, I mean, Albert had such a reputation. 20 years after he was dead, if you were walking down the streets in New York and you were with a wise guy or somebody and you mentioned his name, they'd be looking over their shoulder. <laughs> because that's how much fear he instilled in people. Yeah. So what was his, I mean, his tactics were just to be involved with like the water. Well, he, believed, he believed in, in what they came to America for. He believed in, he believed in the, in, in, in the families. He believed in, uh, in, in the, in the code that they had. Uh, and they lived the Merto. They, they, they lived that way. And they, it was a, I mean, he lived, he moved to Fort Lee, New Jersey, because he never committed a crime in New Jersey. And, and they were looking for him in New York. He could go to George Washington Bridge and get in New Jersey. No one could ever bother him. And it was, I mean, it's, the, the stories are just hilarious when you, when you sit down and think about the power that they had at, at one time and the way that each watched the other. They, they, they helped the cops with certain things and the cops, you know, looked after them and they just, they turned their head the other way. They were, it was, it was just a whole different, whole different way things were run. And they were, to me, it was a much better deal for everybody. So what was your uh, father's relationships or relationship with Charles Lucky Luciano? It wasn't for Albert. Charlie would have never reached the, the, the pinnacle that he reached. And then he got, out, Charlie got in trouble because he worked for a guy called Arnold Rothstein. Yep. Arnold Rothstein taught him everything that he knew. And Arnold was Arnold was a smart, smart guy. Arnold took took gambling off of the gutter streets and put it on green felt tables. <laughs> Arnold Rothstein was 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 a creator of, of of gambling institutions and stuff like that. Very very clever guy, but he also protected in New York and back in the 1900s and 19, there was a lot of opium dens all over the place. So opium was all over, you know, and they, they protected them and they protected the brothels. And that's where they got themselves in trouble because Charlie got linked into prostitution. That's what Dewey put him out of the country for. He said he was, he was the head of prostitution and stuff, which was not really true. He just protected the things that he was taught as a young man. No. Yeah, and he he made that deal with the government and eventually got himself out of it because he was facing prison time, right, for like forty years or something. Well, for they they had again they had a lot of power, you know. Understand? So Charlie got deported, mm-hmm. and, uh, and, and and when my father was assassinated, the Anastasia family became the Gambino family. Mm-hmm. Was Carlo Gambino was his underboss, and the. Luciana family became the Genovese family. Yeah. Zito Genovese came back to New York and he 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 was pushing the drug business big time. And everything he did was kind of stupid. You know, he just he he uh, created a lot of problems for a lot of people. And when he went to jail, when they set him up to go to jail, and he uh, he reached around to, he, he had he had a lot of people were making money on, on, on drugs and prostitution. They forgot how to make money. They went into other areas of making money that were, so all when the drugs that were coming from Sicily into America, the Italians that were involved in that were not allowed to be called Italians. They were called zips. Hmm. They weren't even labeled Italians. They were called zips because the old timers were against the drug business. They weren't really, they were, they were on Albert's side. They didn't really, they thought it was a terrible, Terrible thing, but then people kept saying, but there's so much money going to be made right under your nose and you better keep your handles on it. And, and they, you know, they, so there was a lot of discord 
about yeah. who does what and where does what, and, and they couldn't turn away from the money that was involved. Well, they eventually formed the commission, and that was supposed to be your father. He was was he around for the making of the commission before if he it wasn't was for him. If it wasn't for Robert, there would have been no commission. So him and Charlie Luckily. Luciana put the commission together, and mm -hmm. he only could do that because Albert cleared the way for it. Anybody who was against it disappeared. Jeez. So they were kind of forced into it, right? <laughs> well, they weren't actually forced. It was a better idea. It was, a, yeah. it was an idea to, to unify themselves and to try to put some control in the fact of what they were doing because they were involved in so many different companies and stuff. And there was so much, uh, so many things going on. You had to transition from rail to trucks. Jimmy Hoffa was involved and Jimmy Hoffa took Teamsters and you got, you got to understand where Hoffa came into the play. And, you know, Hoffa took truck drivers, truck drivers before Hoffa worked 18, 20 hours a day. They loaded the truck, they drove the truck and they unloaded the truck and they got paid pittances for it. You understand? Mm -hmm. Hoffa took them and made them where they didn't touch the freight. The trucks were loaded by one set of guys, one guy drove the truck and the other set of guys unloaded the truck. And the guys were getting paid a lot of money and they put he put a pension fund together for them. He put, Hoffa created the Teamsters. And the problem that happened when Hoffa did that, the Teamsters had a lot of voting power. So the Kennedys hated Hoffa. They couldn't stand him. You know, and Jimmy, Jimmy, I love Jimmy Hoffa. Jimmy Hoffa was a man's man. Jimmy Hoffa would never ask you to do what he couldn't do himself, which made him a man's man. You understand? Right. And, and he, what, they uh, put, what they put him away for was ridiculous. They said that he stole $8,000 from the Teamsters Pension Fund to fix his house. Well, Jimmy <laughs> Hoffa needed anything done in his house. People would have done it for nothing because they loved him. Right. I mean, plumbers or whatever, whatever he needed work done re to, to redo his home or anything. But that guys would have lined up to do it for nothing. So it was a bad, it was a bad thing all the way around the board. He just backed the wrong president. Jimmy thought he was only going to go to jail for a couple months. He was, stayed there a few years. He signed the worst deal in the world to get out. It was, and, it was ludicrous. I mean, when Hoffa went to jail, the country shut down. Every truck driver lined up all the way to Lewisburg while he was driving up. They were driving him up to the prison to yeah. turn himself in, and they honked their horns all the way up. The team, it, was, it was amazing. It was an amazing respect. You know, and Jimmy was Jimmy was uh, he, he was his own worst enemy. He, when he came home. He signed a deal that he wasn't supposed to go near the Teamsters, not their office or anything. And he came home, walked right in Fitzsimmons' office, said, get out of my chair and get out of my office. And it's Fitzsimmons said, but Jimmy, you can't do this. You're, you signed an agreement. You got it. You know, he said, this is my union. And I'm taking it back and I'm running it now. Get out of my office. Damn. You know, and, and he got into a phone call with New York. And they told him, Jimmy, you're on the phone. Let it be. We'll take care of it. You just got home. We'll straighten it out. Everything will work out. Don't worry about it. And he they went back and forth, and they bannered back and forth, arguing over, you know, he said, you know, when you people came to me for money for, for Vegas and all, I, I lent it to you out of teams, but they paid back every one of those loans. There was nothing un underhanded or anything. He, they put up 20 million, Teamsters Fund put up $20 million for Caesars Palace when they built Caesars Palace. And they built Vegas, you know, and they, but all the loans were paid back. So they, you know, it was, uh, it came down to the bottom line and Jimmy turned around and said, I'll go to the press. And the guy in New York hung the phone up and that was the end of Jimmy Hoffa. Yeah, because he disappeared so, right after that and nobody ever found found his body. Nobody, and nobody ever will. And, and all the fallacies about who shot Hoffa and how he died and all that stuff. And they just did the Irishman. And that was all bogus. Frank Phelan, I knew Frank Phelan. He was from Philadelphia. He never killed, he never killed Hoffa and he never killed Joey Gallo. That's all Hollywood, you know. Yes, yeah, bison shit up. Just to so make it. It just, it, it wasn't, that's not what really happened. And, you know, 
Uh, did Fallon kill a couple of people? Yeah, he did. But he was a driver for Buffalino. And he worked for for Russell Buffalino and his, and his uh, cousin, uh, Billy, who was a lawyer. And so, in, I mean, so in your conclusion, or if you can talk about it, what do, what do you think happened or who did it? Hoffa? Yeah. Oh, I know exactly where Hoffa went. I know exactly what happened to him. And, you know, he's just, uh, they're never going to find him. That's okay. I can tell you that right now. He's not buried anywhere. And he wasn't cremated. You know, but they're, they're never going to find him. And the funny, there's some funny stories in reference to that because there, there was one guy from Chicago, a, a serious member of the outfit, whose father owned a, a gentleman farm right outside of Chicago. Mm-hmm. And the guy used to go out there and till it up for his father every year. He turned the ground over and prepare it and all that stuff for his, for his crop, or whatever he did. And then he got locked up and he was in jail. So there was nobody. <laughs> his poor father was an older guy. So he told the FBI that Hoffa was buried in his father's farm. And they went out there and dug the whole farm up. Holy <laughs> <should be> off. <laughs> and they didn't get nothing. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> They found nothing because he wasn't there. You know, the yeah. people say he's been holding up highways. They put him in. That's all. All, all those stories are bogus. Where's Hoff? Everybody wondering where Jimmy Hoff? Where Jimmy? Well, you know, so Jimmy you, oh, go ahead. Jimmy's Jimmy's not ever going to be found. Period. I can tell you that right now. So you had a relationship as well with Sam Giancana. Yeah, I knew Sam. What was your Sam. relationship with him? Sam was a good guy. I, I like Sam. Sam was a Sam was a Sam was a good guy. Sam, the only reason why Sinatra didn't get whacked is because Giancana said, "I like the way the kid sings." Jeez. And geez, Sinatra, what were they going to whack him for? Well, he was he was married to he was married to uh, Tony Accardo's niece, mm-hmm. Nancy Sinatra, who was related to Tony Accardo, who was the boss of Chicago. Right. And and when he divorced her, he got in bad light. And he did, Frank had a, had talked too much. Frank had a, had a big mouth. And he played he played with the Kennedys. He was he was he was he was like whoever was there. He was that's whose friend he was at the time. You understand? Yeah, right. And he he, a, uh, he was, just uh, he he wasn't allowed in New York for a long time because of divorcing Nancy. Tony Ricardo to shut him out. And then they built the Westchester Playhouse and the theater, and they brought him back so they could publicize it. And they allowed him back in New York again. And that's how Jilly came involved with him because Jilly would go into restaurants to check out and make sure nobody was in there before Frank went into the restaurant. To go and perform or just to go and eat? Just going and eat. I mean, he wasn't supposed to be in New York at all. You know, and they just, uh, so he, for a while, he was shut, they shut the door. <coughs> But so I mean, Frank he was, was his own worst enemy as well. He just he, he talked a lot, and he was I mean he was just always around the mafia guys. Well, it the- wasn't for them. He, I mean, he was he was owned by he had a contract with Big Band mm-hmm. when, he was, when he started out, and my father got him out of the contract. My father went to the guy and put a gun to his head and said, "Either sign the contract to release, or your brains will be on the page." And the guy released him. So Frank went out and he went on a solo career and became, you know, they 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 watched over him in Vegas and everywhere else. And, you know, he became and he was very talented. Frank was a great entertainer. He no can never take anything away from his talent. Mm-mm. He was a great talent, but he was he just couldn't keep his mouth shut. And, and he had to, and he's and he's always and he, he was a spoiled kid from the time he was a kid. His mother was a super lady. And she worked with the mob. She used to go around and pick up slips for number right and stuff. Yeah, and so. she was and she was well connected. But she, you know, she treated him like a like a prince. I mean, she ironed his underwear and everything. <laughs> so, yeah. He was uh, he was very spoiled, and he, he and he had he suffered from insomnia, terrible. But he just couldn't keep he, he kept associating with this person, that person, and this person, and that person, and he wouldn't, he couldn't keep his mouth shut. Eventually got himself in some trouble. And he got himself in trouble. You know, it's, uh, what, what was his, he was a great entertainer. You could never take away from the talent that the guy had. 
Did what was his ultimate demise? I haven't really looked too much into him. Did he just die of natural causes, or did he? Yeah, Frank. Yeah, Frank. Frank had. He had his, he had his own problems. He was. Uh, so no, he never pissed off the mafia enough to get him killed. Then I suppose he must have no. had the right people to protect him. Well, he just ran into his own problems. He just. Uh, he was at the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah. So, with that, I mean. I mean, all this stuff with the mafia <coughs> was going on with you, and uh, you were around it for how many, how many years? I mean, your entire life were you in all my life? I mean, it was from the time I was like a teenager, you know, it just, mm -hmm. uh, came away of life. You know, I was, was around a lot of good people, and I, I had a lot of respect for them. They had a lot of respect for me, and and I was taught, you know, what I should do, where I should go, and you know how to handle myself. And, and I listened to them, you know, just, uh, and I, and I, you know, you always had to have a legitimate job when you mm -hmm. were younger so that they couldn't say you, you, you lived oh. off of the, off of the, the profits of the mafia or off the street. You had to have a legitimate job somewhere. So I, I was in sports and from sports, I got into the movie business. So I always had a legitimate job and I always had, uh, a way of accounting for myself. Yeah, you know, I mean, you were involved with uh, fighting as well, so you always had a cover for all them years. <laughs> well, I boxed all over the world. You know, I was I was a world ranked fighter for, for a lot of years. Did you ever have to serve any time? No, a couple weekends. That's all. Like they, the FBI chased me a lot. They they were up my nose all the time. They're always trying to fit me with something. The RICO Act came out and different laws that were total bullshit. But they, they try to fit people with conspiracies and stuff. And if you hung around somewhere too long, they would try to put you involved in something that happened in that particular area. So I learned how to move from one place to the other. Yeah, I mean, you were in all these and other countries. And then I countries. married a very powerful Jewish family, and, and I moved to Europe. I lived in Europe for 20 years. Yeah, that's but funny. I also did Superman one and two. I lived in London when we did that. We did because we did a Pinewood Studios, and uh, so I was around. Mm -hmm. So I mean, with the acting and stuff, that was something that really interested you. Yeah, I you know they they came to me. First time they came to me, I was in 1968, 67, 68. Steve McQueen was doing the Thomas Crown Affair in Boston, and I was living in Boston boxing at the time. I, I started out in Philadelphia, got into a little trouble, and they shipped me up to Boston, and and I was undefeated as a heavyweight. And McQueen came in to do Thomas Crown Affair, and we took watched after him to make sure he was okay and everything. And he and I became very good friends. And he said, come on, you know, we put you in the movie, come back to Hollywood, man, we'll have a great time. Blah, blah, blah. So Steve was a, I like Steve, he was a great guy. And yeah. uh, and I said, oh, man, I'm 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 undefeated as a heavyweight, and I'm looking to fight for the title. I think, yeah, I'm not ready for Hollywood. No, no, he said, come on, come on, you don't need this other shit. And uh, I turned it down. And then they came after me in 1968. I knocked out Manuel Ramos, who was number two heavyweight in the world. I'm looking to fight Ali then. And they Raymond Patriarca did a deal with Fox. Because they were doing a picture called The Great White Hope mm -hmm. by Jack Johnson. And when I knocked this guy out in LA, he reached out to Raymond, put a deal together with Eddie Foy at Fox to, for me to do the movie and play the Jess Willard part. And, but it took me off the street for six months. I went to Spain to do it. And when they flew me out to meet the producer, and McQueen said, well, man, you're finally going to come to Hollywood. And I said, I don't know about this. And I sat down with the producer. And, um, I didn't really, I said, I, you want me to give up fighting and go to Spain? And I said, for now, nah, I don't think so. And poor Eddie Foy thought he was in trouble. He said, oh, my God, Raymond's going to be so mad you don't do this. And I said, I'll take care of Raymond. Don't worry about it. So I turned down the picture. And, and I, I remember when I was leaving Fox, I was walking out of the office at Fox, and, and James Earl Jones was coming up the steps as I was walking down, and he stopped me. I'll show you how fast stuff travels around Hollywood. 
he stopped me and he said, you're Jack O'Hallor. And I said, well, you're James Earl Jones. And he said, <laughs> is it true what I just heard about you? And I said, well, it depends on what you heard. And he said, you just told Hollywood to take the biggest movie out of there and stick it. And I said, well, I guess if you want to call it that. He said, I would have shake your hand. I never met anybody that did that before. And we became pretty good friends. James Earl Jones was a good guy. So Raymond did help you with uh well yeah, they wanted me to they wanted to, you know, and I and I I turned it down. So and then when I went to him, I got into the film industry after I retired from boxing and they came to me to do a picture called Farewell My Lovely with Robert Mitchum. Mm-hmm. And I think Raymond had something to do with that as well. They they, they ha- I had an agent in California when I was California heavyweight champion. I lived in San Diego and I did a lot of commercials. So I had a, an agent that did a, the commercials with uh, Royal Crown Coal and some other stuff. And um, she called me on the phone. She said, they want you to do a picture, Farewell My Lovely with Robert Mitchum and I think you should do it. And I looked around where I was and I said, you know what? I think it's time we take a shot at this. So they flew me out to Hollywood to do a screen test. And I did a screen test with Harry Dean Stanton. And Mitchum saw the screen test. He said, it's either him or I don't do the movie. <laughs> and, and I was put into the role of, Am- of uh, uh, Moose Malloy in Farewell, My Lovely. And it worked out very well. Mitchum and I became really good friends and, and just... Uh, the industry and I got on very well. The camera loved me, and it just it worked out pretty good. And Mitch and taught me a lot. Well, you, you couldn't have a better mentor than him. And uh, and my career just went crazy. Went went from Farewell My Lovely to King Kong, and one movie after the other. Yeah, and it just kept coming and coming. So, from uh, from like now, I mean, what do you? do now just kind of retire lay back and just no we've got four projects we're getting ready to i wrote a book called family legacy which okay what's tells that about truth. that's about from my father's death to the kennedy death and i tell the truth about all the changes in the country that happened during that mm-hmm. period of time oh i'm sure there's and a lot I tell the truth about the kennedy assassination what really really happened and why it happened and mm-hmm. uh and the book's been very, very successful. So we're going to make a movie out of it. We're going to do two films, and then we're going to turn it into a series because I got two more books going to do. And a lot of guys, a lot of older guys, are looking to tell the truth about things that really happened before they pass away. Ready to so get it out so there. Tired of, they're so tired of the media, social media's version of what happened in the country. You know, that'd and be interesting. Time to tell the truth. Yeah, before, like you said, before they pass away, I mean, might as well get the truth out there and yeah, I mean, it's, and it's, it's, set the record it's, straight. So I wrote a book, and I have, and I have the right to use all the people's names that that was involved with me and stuff. And uh, so, book's been very successful. So we're going to make a film out of it. It'll be bigger than The Godfather because it's going to be about the real Godfather, you know. Yeah, and we're um, going to tell the truth about how the changes happened in the country and stuff and. And people are fascinated with all that stuff. And the fact that the Hollywood takes liberties and does pictures that tells their version of what they think happened and, and inventing, because everybody's always curious, looking for answers. Right. Um, it's like social media. It's like people, people mm-hmm. sit in front of their televisions every day and listen to the news and they believe what people are telling them, but they don't realize that most news channels are created to win awards. They don't tell you the truth about what's really going on in the world. They tell you what they want you to know. Exactly. You know, this is so much, there's so much, I mean, if you look at the political status of where this country is right now and all the backstabbing with Trump and with Biden and, and, the, and how much illegal stuff these guys did and this guy did and that, and they call us burglars, they call us thieves. <laughs> These guys right. are the worst thieves in the world. And they, 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 they had the, the guts to call us thieves. You understand? Yeah. No, you're right. So I'm, I'm, that's pretty cool that you're still kicking it and still and you know going in fast gear because you got all these projects coming. And I think it, you're right. I, it'll be interesting to hear the real side of the story because <clears throat> you got the guys that are ready to talk. I mean, they're not. I mean, after they're gone, 
they realize. Well, they, they would like to set the record straight before they are gone. There's some exactly. guys who are 80, 90 years old. I mean, it, it just never, it never ceases. I mean, they, they, they try to indict guys that are 80 years old. You're going to put a guy in jail when he's 80 or something that happened 30 years ago. You know, and they got all these people running around shooting people. This is insanity. What's going on in our country, right? They're trying to put socialism in a country where it never it, socialism never worked anywhere. <coughs> it makes them think it's going to work in America. Yeah, the times are you definitely mean? changing over the years, like you said. You know, it's just uh, if America's got to alert, turn around and pick America back up again and take it back, mm-hmm. that's what's got to happen. And Americans will do that. They get pushed against the wall, and they'll, they'll come back fighting for the. So, taking away your democracy is is not a good thing. I was gonna also bring up what where is uh, where can the people find like your your books and everything? Family Legacy, just go online. There's a there's a a site, familylegacytonovel.com that you can go on, or just go to Amazon. Okay, it's on Amazon. It's called Family Legacy, and uh, we're just getting ready to put out another book pretty in the next month and we're going to we're getting ready to film we're going to film the book and just, uh, i'm getting kind of excited about it because we're going to really put out the truth and it's going to be up on the screen and you know people need to know people go to movies to be entertained you know what i'm saying oh yeah and, and this will be give them the proper entertainment and, and show them and people and, and it's amazing you know i wrote this book 10 years ago and all the people who have read it, they're putting remarks on Amazon and all, of all favorable remarks about it. And there's one old guy who's a New York guy, it must have been his 90s. He wrote, he wrote a thing, he said, you know, this book is the best thing I've ever read because it tells the truth and mentions all the real names of people that were involved in things. He said, and, it's, and I would say it's better than 80% totally accurate because I lived it. And I watched things happen. Wow. And, and so many things have happened that no one's ever talked. People talk about it in their kitchens, but they never see it in the newspaper on the news. No. Yeah. So that's good that you have, I mean, someone even like him saying that because he, well, he a whole bunch of people said almost a similar deal, you know, like uh, thank God for the truth and stuff of that nature. So it's, 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 uh, it's just, it's time that people, are aware of, of the changes in, in our in our own country that she, they should be aware of why things happen and why things turned around the way they are. Yeah, and I think this movie, this project that you got coming, is definitely going to set the the record straight. And on top of that, give people the truth because it, it'll it'll be different. Because I mean, it will sound even more credible with all the real names and the real things that these guys were actually involved with and how it really took place. I mean, it'll just make more sense, you know? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be a movie that will affect people from 90 years old down to teenagers. Because everybody's passed stories down in the family and no Mm -hmm. one's ever saw it actually put out in reality and truth and seeing it up on the big screen is going to put a lot of truth to things. So it's good. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you coming on, Jack. I really do. Hey, it's my pleasure. Yeah, sure. man. Um, but if we ever want to do another one, we can always do another one, man, because you got so many stories. <laughs> Anytime. I mean, we, we have so much of the movie business to talk about. No, I know. Business to talk about. You know, anything, sure, anytime you want. Well, what everyone think? Jack's got one hell of a story. His father was Albert Anastasia. Not a lot of people could say that. Fortunately for Jack, he didn't have the same outcome as his father. Jack has been a part of a lot of major movies, and he was a professional fighter. He really made the right move to invest in himself. Please comment any key takeaways that you got from this interview. Please share it with anyone that you think will enjoy it. Also, please don't forget to hit subscribe to my channel. I'll put the link to Jack's website in the video description below. Please check out his website and support him and everything that he's got going on. At the end of this interview, you'll see a Mafia playlist pop up of all my other Mafia-related interviews that I've done in the past. 
I've interviewed capos, made men, associates of the mafia, and on the other side of it as well, the law enforcement that took down the mafia. I've also interviewed lots of family members that were related to men of the mafia, such as Jack himself, and I've interviewed a lot of mafia historians who wrote in books about the mafia. If you want to support me and my clothing brand, I got t-shirts, hoodies, beanies, and sweats all on my website. I'll be sure to put my website in the video description below. And the last thing that I'll bring up is my Mafia documentary series that I've been working on. This documentary series has 11 episodes. Each episode is about a different crime family. Please check out this trailer to get a better understanding on what my documentary series is going to be about. And thank you again so much for watching. This life is very twisted. You never know when it's your time to go. One day you're putting in work with someone and the next day they're taking you out. In our days, it was very quiet, you know, nobody ever talked about this, you know, nobody glamorized it. It was all like hush hush. Not a glamorous life. And again, it's not what you see in Goodfellas. It's not what you see in Casino. Some days you were dead broke. Some days you had two grand in your pocket. It wasn't every day. You know, you don't know anything else. You don't know what it is to go wake up six o'clock and go to work. Work? What the fuck is that? I wasn't going to work. Even bosses get murdered in this life. There was younger guys underneath him, and he wasn't doing the right thing, I guess. He was coming out of the card game, and unfortunately, uh, a lone gunman came up and shot him five times. People who knew me would tell you, I like to use the bat a lot. If I had to shoot you, I'd shoot you too. I've done that. This life requires many mixed personalities. You have to wear many hats in this life to try and survive. You become four or five different people all at once, and... You gotta go home and be a dad and a husband. You gotta go to work and do your job. You gotta be out in the street and be a gangster. The Bonanno family is called the Bonanno family because of my grandfather, Joe Bonanno. That life there is gone. Uh, today you have to be legitimate yeah, today. Man. But you're gonna be an idiot to right. wanna be a hooligan today. Because Jail time's now like 100 years for doing right. nothing. Yeah, you, you'll be dead in prison for life or in the witness protection program. I don't know anybody. Now, when the Mafia turned their back on me, I know everybody. There was the big flip of the Gambino underboss, Sammy the Bull Gravano. Here he is, signing autographs in a restaurant on Mulberry Street. It was supposed to be a secret organization. He was a very, very, very violent guy, no question about it. Albert Anastasia, he was a Brooklyn guy. He was probably the biggest killer in the history of the mob. Michael Francis, his father, Sonny, uh, was a really tough guy, but he really raised his son right. Son, if you want to see a gangster, that's Sonny Francis. And John Cena, you don't compliment anybody. This is a documentary series about the American Mafia. It includes 11 different crime families. Each episode is about a different one. The crime families include the Gambino, Genovese, Bonanno, Colombo, Lucchese, the Gallo Crew, Chicago Outfit, the Philadelphia Mafia, the Patriarca, the Traficante Crime Family, and the Jewish Mafia. Please subscribe to my channel to watch each episode as they come out.